Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. In 1933, worldwide attention focused on a long, thin lake in northern Scotland. The lake was Loch Ness, and the world was riveted by reports that there was a monster living in it. Since then, numerous people have flocked to the lake in hopes of seeing the creature. Some came away with impressive pictures and even motion picture footage of what they saw. There have even been scientific surveys to look for the Loch Ness Monster. You're listening to episode 237 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're analyzing the Loch Ness Monster and what may be at the root of this mystery. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1933, the Loch Ness Monster burst into public consciousness. It became a worldwide sensation and has been famous ever since. Last week, we looked at how the mystery began and covered what the early historical accounts say. This week, we go into analysis mode. One theory is that the monster may be a plesiosaur that has survived from the age of the dinosaurs. So how can we explain the monster sightings? What have the scientific surveys found? And does the Loch Ness Monster really exist? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. And Jimmy, what theories are there about the Loch Ness Monster? So they fall into two basic classes. Uh, first, that there aren't any unusual creatures living in Loch Ness. And second, that there are unusual creatures living in Loch Ness, whether they're plesiosaur-like life forms or something else. Now, before we get to the reason perspective, what can we say about the Loch Ness Monster from the faith perspective? There's not really a lot to say from the faith perspective this week. By all accounts, the Loch Ness Monster is just an animal that lives in Loch Ness. I mean, there may be other accounts, but at least the mainstream account is that it's an animal. And God has made a lot of animals, and the Loch Ness Monster could j just be one more creature that God has made, even if it turns out to be true that the monster is a survival from the age of dinosaurs, like a plesiosaur, that wouldn't really affect things from the faith perspective, because the church has no problem with the idea that the dinosaurs were real, that they lived millions of years ago, and that they went extinct, allowing modern creatures to evolve under God's providence. We still even have little dinosaurs today, because that's what birds are. And other creatures from that age, like alligators and crocodiles, have also survived. So if a plesiosaur population had survived too, that would be no problem from the faith perspective. In fact, it would be cool. It would. So then what can we say about the Loch Ness Monster from the reason perspective? How do you want to proceed with looking at the evidence? The first thing I'd like to do is talk about the general state of the evidence. Then I'd like to talk about the most popular theory, which is the idea that the Loch Ness Monster is some kind of plesiosaur thing. And then if that theory doesn't pan out, we can talk about alternative theories. All right, what do you want to say about the general state of the evidence? A lot of it isn't good. Uh, there have been untold numbers of reported sightings and poor quality photos and videos, but most of these don't really have evidential value. Many witnesses report seeing something in the distance, but it's not clear what that something is. Since humans are bad at judging the size of distant things floating in water with no nearby objects to give a sense of scale, it's quite possible that they could be perceiving conventional animals in the distance as being bigger than they really are. They thus might see the silhouette of a bird in the distant water and think it's the head of a monster poking up from underneath. Or it might be deer swimming in the loch as deer swim pretty regularly. And that means that we can't use these distant sightings to show that there is a monster living in Loch Ness. Similarly, many photos and videos are taken at such a distance that we can't determine anything about what we're looking at. It could be a monster, but it also could be anything else. And since monsters are rare, 
it probably is something else. So these distant photos also don't really have evidential value towards showing that a monster exists in the loch. Because of this inconclusiveness, we're, we've only looked at some of the best of the sighting reports and photos, which we covered last episode. The rest we haven't covered because they don't really help us get toward our goal, but you can read about them in books and on websites that we'll have links to. The fact that many of the sightings, photos, and videos don't have evidential value doesn't mean that the Loch Ness Monster doesn't exist, does it? No, not at all. Um, as we pointed out in previous episodes, all you need is one genuine encounter with a strange creature, and you've proved that there is some kind of strange creature living in Loch Ness. So we need to consider the best of the individual encounters that have been reported. Then let's look at the most popular theory about the Loch Ness Monster, that it's a plesiosaur or something like that. How do you want to proceed on this issue? I'd like to frame the issue by asking the question, how likely is it that a population of plesiosaurs could survive and still be in Loch Ness today? Then I'd like to review the photographic evidence we've covered and see whether it supports the plesiosaur hypothesis. And then afterwards, we can look at the witness reports that didn't provide photographic evidence. How likely is it that a population of plesiosaurs could have survived the extinction of the dinosaurs? There have certainly been other ancient life forms that have survived, hidden, for millions of years, like the coelacanth. That's correct. The coelacanth is a kind of fish that lived 400 million years ago, and it was believed to have gone extinct around the same time the dinosaurs did, about 66 million years ago. But it was rediscovered in 1938 when a coelacanth turned up in the net of some fishermen who had been catching fish in the Indian Ocean off the coast of South Africa. The coelacanth then became known as a living fossil. So yes, uh, creatures from dinosaur days can still exist, and the coelacanth is one of them. But there are differences between coelacanths and plesiosaurs, and these differences make it less likely that plesiosaurs would survive. In their book, Abominable Science, Daniel Loxton and Donald Prothero write, Coelacanths live in very deep water in only a few areas along the perimeter of the Indian Ocean from South Africa to Indonesia. Given how rare they are and how seldom they come near the surface, it's not surprising that they were not found until 1938. But plesiosaurs were surface-dwelling, air-breathing reptiles that lived in the tropical waters of the Epicontinental Seas and the Tethys Sea during the Cretaceous period 144 to 65 million years ago, and that it is extremely unlikely that any survive. So there's a big difference between a deep water fish that doesn't need to come to the surface to breathe and a marine reptile that needs to regularly surface in order to breathe. When the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs hit, it caused havoc on the surface of the planet, and the plesiosaurs being tethered to the, serpent, to the surface were all exposed to that havoc because they, like all reptiles, need to breathe. Meanwhile, the coelacanths could weather the surface storm because they were down in deep water away from all the chaos. Are there other factors that would make plesiosaurs less likely than coelacanths to survive? Yeah, they were a lot bigger. Coelacanths only grow up to 200 pounds or so maximum, whereas plesiosaurs could grow up to 100,000 pounds. 50 times larger, and that means they'd need to eat a lot more food. But the food chain on the surface collapsed after the asteroid strike. I mean, that's, that's what killed most of the dinosaurs. It wasn't the initial impact. That only killed creatures near the impact site in Mexico and, you know, surrounding areas in the Americas. And it caused tsunamis that went into the shallow seas that were covering parts of North and South America as well as elsewhere. But it wasn't the impact itself that produced the mass extinction. Instead, the impact kicked up lots of particulate matter into the Earth's atmosphere, and that caused a dramatic cooling event known as an impact winter. For years, the impact winter prevented enough sunlight from reaching the Earth's surface, causing land plants and algae in the oceans 
not to be able to get enough light to effectively photosynthesize. That meant that animals that feed on plants and sea creatures that feed on algae didn't get enough food, and so many of them starved to death. Then, in turn, carnivores that eat other animals also had a harder time finding food, and they starved as well. And so the impact winter undermined the plants and algae at the basis of the food chain, causing it to collapse. This is why on land, most four-footed creatures that weighed more than 55 pounds died off. They, they just couldn't get enough food to feed their bulk, and that left ecological niches that new species could evolve into. Now, most plesiosaurs were carnivorous. I mean, they couldn't live on stones alone. So when the food chain collapsed near the surface, they would have starved too, given how big they could get, while smaller, deep-water coelacanths would have had a much easier time surviving. Does the temperature difference between the surface and the deep also play a role? It's a lot colder in the deep ocean than it is on the surface. Yeah, this, this also would have played a role. Neither plesiosaurs nor coelacanths were warm-blooded, so they didn't need their metabolisms to run as fast as a mammal would um, or a dinosaur. I mean, that is one of the reasons the dinosaurs died out. Like us, they were warm-blooded creatures, and that meant they needed to have fast metabolisms. And so, you know, both of us need, both us and the dinosaurs, need to eat all the time to keep our metabolisms running. But there would have been a metabolic difference still, even though they weren't warm-blooded, between plesiosaurs and coelacanths. The coelacanths, as we said, spend most of their time down between 300 and 1,500 feet in the ocean. And at those depths, it's a lot colder. So coelacanths have metabolisms that run a lot slower, and that means they need less food, while plesiosaurs were tied to the surface where the waters are warmer meaning that their metabolisms would run faster than a coelacanth's, and so they would need more food for that reason, too. By being small and deep, coelacanths had a better chance of surviving relatively unaltered in evolutionary terms compared to plesiosaurs, who were bigger and warmer. Why do you say surviving relatively unaltered in evolutionary terms? Because when an organism's environment changes, it puts pressure on the organism to change as well. Organisms need to change with their environment if they're going to survive. And so coelacanths, living down in the deep water where the environment didn't change that much, didn't have evolutionary pressure on them to change their body forms. But plesiosaurs, living at the surface where the environment was completely disrupted, would have had much more evolutionary pressure to change. If they survived at all, we wouldn't expect them to look like the plesiosaurs of 66 million years ago. They should either be dead or they should look quite different due to the need to change with their environment. We also have to address the question of how they would have gotten into Loch Ness, because Scotland was covered by glaciers during the Ice Age, and the valley that now contains the loch was filled up with ice. So plesiosaurs obviously weren't swimming around in it then. Yeah, um, and in their Nature article, Rhines and Scott speculate that the plesiosaur population in the loch is of recent origin. They write, Between the melting ice and the present time, the loch was probably, rather briefly, an arm of the sea. A population may therefore have become landlocked some 12,000 years ago. The possibility that juvenile animals may have ascended the five miles of the River Ness more recently seems less likely. So you also sometimes hear claims that the loch is connected to the sea by underwater tunnels, and so maybe the plesiosaurs got in that way. However, it appears this isn't the case. Uh, the surface of Loch Ness, as we mentioned last episode, is 50 feet above sea level, and if it had underwater tunnels linking it to the sea, the weight of that additional 50 feet of water would create downward pressure forcing the water through the tunnels and out to the sea until the water in the loch dropped 50 feet and was at sea level. The water in the loch isn't equal with sea level, so there aren't such underwater tunnels. And any creatures that have arrived in the loch recently from the ocean would have needed to swim up the River Ness. 
And if they were to survive once they got to the lock, it wouldn't be enough for there to be just one of them. For them to survive over time, they'd need a breeding population. And that population would need to be living out its life cycle in the lock, since we don't see plesiosaurs coming up the river nests all the time like trout do when they need to go to their spawning grounds. In their Nature article, Rhines and Scott estimate that they would need a breeding population of about 30 monsters in the loch in order to survive. But the loch is only 22 miles long and a little more than a mile wide and only a few hundred feet deep. As a result, there'd need to be one and a half monsters for every mile of Loch Ness's length, more than a monster a mile. Since they'd be reptiles, They would need to regularly surface to breathe. They'd also need to find enough food in the loch to sustain themselves. With enough fish breeding in each mile of the loch and getting caught and eaten by the monsters, without the monsters driving the fish to extinction. So the fish would have to be breeding enough surplus fish to keep their population stable and feed the monsters. The monsters themselves would need to breed to sustain their own population, and they need to do all that while staying hidden, which means that they need to do these things without getting into fights with each other as carnivores over territory and food and mates, because that would make their presence obvious. And I find it hard to imagine that large carnivores could could stay so quiet and hidden and not get in fights in that way. So it doesn't sound like you think the probability of such a breeding population is high. No, at least before we consider the evidence that has been claimed for their existence. I find it antecedently unlikely that large surface-tethered carnivores would survive the late Cretaceous extinction event that if they did survive, they would be able to survive the evolutionary pressures of the environmental change and still look like plesiosaurs, and that a population of 30 of them could be living in a 22-mile-long lake without their presence being obvious. But this is just the antecedent probability, meaning the probability I would assign before we look at the evidence. Then let's look at that evidence. What do you make of reports before 1933? That's a tricky issue because if you examine the historical record, it's actually difficult to find reports of the Loch Ness Monster before 1933. But the Inverness Courier opened its story by saying, Loch Ness has for generations been credited with being the home of a fearsome-looking monster. Yeah, but that doesn't mean what you think. Um, Loch Ness has not historically had reports of plesiosaur-like animals living in it. Instead, like many other lakes and rivers in Scotland, it was reportedly the home of creatures known as kelpies, water horses, and water bulls, which were not thought to be animals, but spiritual creatures. In Abominable Science, Loxton explains, In Scottish folklore, water bulls are small black bulls that are encountered when they venture onto land. They sometimes breed with terrestrial cattle before returning to the water. Water horses, or the distinct but similar kelpies, are lethal, shape-shifting demons. They are likewise encountered on land in the form of ordinary-looking horses, often with weeds in their manes and wet-looking adhesive skin. If anyone is foolish enough to climb onto the back of a water horse, he or she will become stuck in place, and the water horse will carry the rider screaming into the water. Children are a favorite prey of water horses. Often he grazes in a field near the water, as one historian described the folklore in 1933, and by his tameness tempts children to mount him. As they mount, he lengthens his back until all are accommodated in a line when he rushes with them into the water. Water horses are much closer to vampires or werewolves than to any modern cryptid. When killed, the water horse proved to be nothing but turf and a soft mass like jellyfish, explained an article about the mythical beasts of Scotland just weeks before the dawn of the Nessie legend. It could be shot only with a silver bullet, excellent proof of its supernatural character. Even more vampire-like, water horses can take human form. In such form, he very often goes courting a young woman 
with the entirely unromantic object of consuming her. So these creatures don't sound like plesiosaurs. Loxton continues. Supernatural creatures with no true physical form, water horses can be identified with modern cryptids only by badly distorting Scottish folklore. They do not act like or resemble Nessie in any meaningful respect. Moreover, they are part of global folklore and have no unique association with Loch Ness. Water horses are said to lurk in most of the bodies of water in Scotland, including Loch Lamond, Loch Glass, Loch Awe, Loch Ranach, Loch Caldshells, Loch Horn, Loch Bazabal, Loch Na on the island of Rasse, Loch Garbet Beg, Loch Garten, and Loch Pituyish. Nor are they restricted to the United Kingdom. According to folklorist Michael Merger, water horses are very widespread in the British Isles, Scandinavia, Siberian Russia, France, Italy, Czechoslovakia, and southern Slavic countries. So not only are the creatures from folklore not plesiosaurs, they're also not distinctly associated with Loch Ness. Uh, they're all over the place, making it hard to say that these creatures are the basis of the Loch Ness Monster. They're their own thing. Yeah, isn't there a legend about the Irish monk St. Columba defeating the Loch Ness Monster in AD 565? Uh, you hear that a lot, but no, there isn't. Um, there is a story about St. Columba doing a miracle to convert the local Picts to Christianity. In the story, he defeats a water beast of some kind by making the sign of the cross and telling it to go away, leading the Picts to marvel at the miracle of God that they've just witnessed. But there are problems with the story. First, there isn't any, any information about the nature of the water beast. And as we've just heard, there are lots of legends about water beasts. And there's nothing in particular that makes it sound like the Loch Ness Monster in this legend. Second, the story does not take place in Loch Ness. Instead, it's set in the River Ness. And third, it's a, mirac it's a miraculous saint story that was written down 130 years after it supposedly occurred. 130 years is enough time for a legend to develop, and given the legendary nature of a lot of hagiographical stories, we can't put evidential weight on a miracle story that is first attested 130 years after the miracle allegedly occurred with no intervening records. Uh, we need a more contemporary account. So, no, I don't see reports from prior to 1933 as having evidential value for establishing the reality of a monster in Loch Ness. Then let's look at the ones that began in 1933. In particular, let's look at the ones involving photographs, since those provide harder evidence than just witness reports. The first photo we got was taken in November 1933 by Hugh Gray. What do you make of it? It's blurry. Uh, in fact, it's really, really blurry, so that it also doesn't have any evidential value for us because we can't tell with confidence what we're looking at. In addition to the idea that it is showing us the monster, other proposals have also been made for what the photo contains, such as a swan sticking its head down below the surface of the water, and we're just seeing a blurry version of its body. This is a proposal made in Darren Nash's book, Hunting Monsters. Another interpretation is based on the fact that Mr. Gray had a golden retriever that he apparently took on walks, on the, and in fact, took a walk with on the day he took the photograph. And some have tried to clean up the photograph digitally, and they've seen what looks like a dog's face in it. So the idea for this claim, or this interpretation, is that Gray's golden retriever got into the water, possibly after he threw a stick for it to retrieve, and he got a picture of it swimming back to him. But the picture was so blurry that he accidentally thought it was the monster when he looked at the picture later, or that it was so blurry that he decided he could use it as a monster hoax. But to me, the image looks like something else, which others have also proposed. To me, the photograph looks like a common European otter floating on its back. Otters regularly on their backs. It's one of their most characteristic behaviors, 
And if you look closely at a high quality version of the image, you can see the otter's overall shape, its nose, its eye. Allegedly, you can even see a reflection in the eye. Also, its mouth, its fore and hind limbs, and its tail can be seen. But the bottom line is that this image is so blurry that it doesn't provide evidence for anything. What about the most famous photo, the surgeon's photograph from 1934? This photo is often shown cropped so that it's a close-up of the object in the frame, and this, makes, this cropping makes it look like the monster is so large that the ripples around it are waves. But if you look at the uncropped photo, you see a much larger scene. In the uncropped version, you can see all the way to the far side of the lock, and that gives you a general sense of scale. You know, the lock is no more than a mile wide. And so when you can see that scale, you can tell that the so-called monster is tiny. And the motions around it in the water aren't waves, but just ripples. In 1984, a man named Stuart Campbell analyzed the picture for an article that appeared in the British Journal of Photography, and he concluded that the object is at most between two and three feet long. And it's not a real but tiny monster, because the image simply appears to be a hoax. Wikipedia summarizes, Since 1994, most agree that the photo was an elaborate hoax. Details of how the photo was taken were published in the 1999 book Nessie, the surgeon's photograph exposed. The creature was reportedly a toy submarine built by Christian Sperling, the son-in-law of Marmaduke Wetherell. Wetherell had been publicly ridiculed by his employer, the Daily Mail, after he found Nessie footprints that turned out to be a hoax. Okay, so that's a reference to a story that the site lock-ness.com goes on to explain. Wetherill was a big game hunter who was commissioned by the Daily Mail in 1933 to investigate the Loch Ness Monster. Shortly after arriving at the loch, he discovered footprints on the loch side. He can be seen here examining them before plaster casts were taken and they were sent to the British Museum of Natural History. It took the British Museum of Natural History some time to realize that the prints were from the left hind foot of a hippopotamus. One of the reasons it may have taken a while to identify was because it was made from a dried hippo foot. In fact, it was made from a trophy ashtray which had been made from a hippo's foot. For years, it was thought that a hippo foot umbrella stand had been used, and it was only David Martin and Alistair Boyd's research which tracked down the actual object used. When the hippo hoax was exposed, Wetherill was made to look rather foolish and was sacked by the Daily Mail. So Wetherill used a novelty ashtray made from a hippopotamus foot to fake his Loch Ness Monster footprints at the lake for a story for his employer, the Daily Mail. Not only did the British Museum of Natural History eventually recognize that this was a hippo footprint, researchers also tracked down the actual ashtray he used and Wetherill was fired by the Daily Mail. Back to Wikipedia. To get revenge on the mail, Wetherill perpetrated his hoax with co-conspirators Sperling, a sculpture specialist, Ian Wetherill, his son, who bought the material for the fake, and Maurice Chambers, an insurance agent. The toy submarine was bought from F.W. Woolworths, and its head and neck were made from wood putty. After testing it in a local pond, the group went to Loch Ness, where Ian Wetherill took the photos near the Altsay Tea House. When they heard a water bailiff approaching, Duke Wetherill sank the model with its foot, and it is presumably still somewhere in Loch Ness. Chambers gave the photographic plates to the obstetrician Wilson, a friend of his who enjoyed a good practical joke. Dr. Wilson then sold the first photo to the Daily Mail, who then announced that the monster had been photographed. In its page on the Loch Ness Monster, the Museum of Hoaxes states, This was revealed in 1994 when Christian Sperling, before his death at the age of 90, confessed to his involvement in a plot involving both Wetherill and Colonel Wilson to create the famous surgeon's photo. According to Sperling, he had been approached by Wetherill, his stepfather, who wanted him to make a convincing serpent model. The model was then taken to Loch Ness, photographed, and the pictures were given to Wilson, whom Wetherill felt would be a creditable 
front man since he was a surgeon. Apparently, Wetherill's motive for concocting the elaborate plot was revenge, since he was still smarting from his humiliation over the hippo foot tracks. We'll give them their monster, his son later remembered him saying. And once the story came out, the Daily Mail got its own revenge in turn, publishing a story with the headline, Mock Ness Monster, along with photographs of the co-conspirators and a diagram of the toy submarine with the fake monster head attached. So the most famous photo of the Loch Ness Monster turns out to be a hoax. But what about the underwater photos taken by Robert Rines and his team? They went to a lot of effort to bring sonar and underwater photographic equipment to the loch. Have their photos turned out to be hoaxes? Did they hoax the prestigious scientific journal Nature with the article they published? Robert Rines did have a PhD, and his colleague Sir Peter Scott was a respected naturalist. The general consensus seems to be that they were sincere believers in the existence of the monster and that they didn't deliberately hoax anything. However, there are problems with their photos. First, there are the 1972 photos of the diamond-shaped fins. These are apparently genuine, but when they developed them, the photos weren't clear, and so they did something that people sometimes do with unclear photos. They had them retouched. Loxton explains, The resulting photos were extremely indistinct, but were altered by an artist to depict an unmistakable flipper. Exactly how that modification was done is controversial to this day. After a computer enhancement, the original photos remained ambiguous, only to later achieve shocking clarity through some additional undocumented process of creative compositing or retouching. According to Nessie author Tony Harmsworth, paint brush marks are clearly visible on large blow-ups of the revised versions. That is how it became so clearly a flipper, Harmsworth explains. The retouching is not sophisticated airbrushing or modern Photoshop effects, but relatively crude paintbrush effects. Confronted with this evidence at a tense meeting with Adrian Shine, Rhines himself admitted that there may have been retouching by a magazine editor. And if you examine the unretouched photos next to the retouched versions, it's really clear how much work has been done. The unretouched version doesn't contain anything that looks like a diamond-shaped fin. Instead, it seems that Ryan saw an indistinct pattern in the original that he interpreted as a diamond-shaped fin, and then he had it retouched to bring out this indistinct pattern much more vividly. And he later admitted that the photo may have been retouched, although he said it may have been by a magazine editor, and that could be the case. However, the retouching destroys the scientific value of, these, of, of those versions of the photo, and the original versions do not provide good evidence of anything with diamond-shaped fins. What about the 1975 photo that showed a plesiosaur-like creature underwater, with its head, body, and forelimbs drifting into frame? This one is also problematic. It's a murky photo because of all the particulate matter in the loch due to the peat in the surrounding soil. But if you look at it the right way, the object can look like a plesiosaur coming into frame. However, what would be the creature's flippers are extremely short. They aren't diamond-shaped. There's a weird bump on what would be the creature's chest, and the extension that looks like a neck and its head are preternaturally straight, not curving. It also looks a lot less like a plesiosaur if you rotate it by 90 degrees, like the version that appeared in Nature. When you do that, and you look at it from another angle, instead of a plesiosaur, it looks a lot more like a tree stump, with the alleged protrusion of the neck and the tiny protrusions of the flippers perhaps being roots coming off of the stump. And so the pictures of the Loch Ness Monster that so thrilled me when they appeared in Time magazine in 1975 turn out to be not so thrilling after all. So it looks like Robert Rines and Sir Peter Scott were innocently mistaken rather than deliberate hoaxers. That's the way it looks, uh, though some people have looked at the name that they proposed for the creature, Nesiteras rhombopteryx, and said that if you rearrange the letters, it could be an anagram of 
Monster Hoax by Sir Peter S. However, Robert Rhines, whose initial is the letter R, retorted that it also can be an anagram for, yes, both picks are monsters, R. If you have any sufficiently long string of consonants and vowels, you can find any number of anagrams in it, and Nesoteras rhombopteryx is 22 letters long and could simply be turned into multiple anagrams, so I don't think the anagrams really tell us anything. At least one of the anagrams must be coincidental, and in view of the two men's evident sincerity, uh, the truth is that they're probably both coincidental and don't really mean anything. Before we move on to the rest of our evidence and analysis, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make the show possible, including Melissa K, AJ, Jenny N, Matt and Yolanda C, and Sean F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit delivercontacts.com. Now, Jimmy, if the photographs don't have evidential value for establishing the existence of the monster, What about the reports of people seeing it? A lot of people have seen things in the distance, and because they're hoping to see the monster, they've assumed that what they're seeing was Nessie. However, in many cases, they were seeing something else, like distant animals that found their way into the loch, including things like otters, birds, seals, and porpoises, some of which may have swum up the river Ness, or They may have seen rocks or stumps sticking out of the water, or wood floating in the water, or fish leaping and causing splashes, but most of these reports are not high-quality close-up ones. And what about the early reports from 1933, where two couples saw the monster close enough to describe it? An alleged close-up sighting does not have the same value as photographic evidence because it doesn't provide evidence that we can examine. And people's perceptions and memories can be fuzzy, not to mention the possibility of hoaxes. And there have definitely been hoaxes connected with the monster. But taking all that into account, we still need to look at the two early couple accounts to see what value that they may have. Then what about that first encounter where Mr. and Mrs. John and Aldi McKay saw it? On that report, Loxton says this. The McKays clarified their sighting later that year when they spoke with Rupert Gould, author of The Loch Ness Monster and Others. First, Aldi was the only one who saw any kind of object or animal. Her husband saw only splashing. The Inverness Courier's article's, quote, tremendous upheaval was perhaps a little exaggerated. Aldi thought at first that it was caused by two ducks fighting, although she decided on reflection that the splashing was far too extensive to be caused this way. When she finally saw the cause of the splashing, it was not one body, quote, resembling that of a whale, but two dark humps in the distance. The two humps had a total length, she estimated, of about 20 feet. If accurate, this would make each hump about the size of a seal. Because Loch Ness is connected to the North Sea by both a river and a canal, seals play an important role in Nessie debates to this day, as we will see. So only Mrs. McKay claimed to see the source of the splashing. She first thought it was two ducks fighting, and then she saw two dark humps that would be about the size of seals, and seals can come up the river Ness and get into the loch. Also, another possibility was raised by a man who had a lot of experience on the loch. Loxton reports, In a response to the Inverness Courier, steamship captain John MacDonald expressed exasperation with the McKay's amateur description of a tremendous upheaval on the loch. I am afraid, he wrote, that it was their imagination that was stirred, and that the spectacle is not an extraordinary one. 
During 50 years of navigating the loch, no fewer than 20,000 trips up and down Loch Ness, MacDonald had become familiar with an ordinary occurrence that very closely matched the McKay's description. Sporting salmon in lively mood, who by their leaping out of the water and racing about, created a great commotion in the calm waters, and certainly looked strange and perhaps fearsome when viewed some distance from the scene. So, in addition to it being fighting ducks or fighting seals, a man with extensive experience on the loch indicated that rambunctious salmon produced those kinds of disturbances in the water all the time. Thus, Mrs. McKay likely saw something, but we can't say what it was with any confidence. So, not a lot of evidential value here. What about the sighting in July 1933, when George Spicer and his wife said they came across the monster crossing the road? This one also is problematic. Uh, Not only do significant details of the story change over time, like in his initial letter, Mr. Spicer indicated that the monster had a small lamb or animal of some kind in its mouth. He later said he didn't see its head at all. So how could he have seen what was in its mouth? But there are other troubling things. Notice the following facts whose significance will become apparent. The Spicer account is the first one to suggest that the monster was a dinosaur creature or a creature from the era of dinosaurs, with Spicer comparing it to a dragon or prehistoric animal. His account was the first to suggest that the monster had a long neck. His account is the first to suggest that it could travel on land in addition to being aquatic. He said that it crossed the road from left to right. He also did not clearly see its tail, which he thought might be wrapped around the other side of its body. He said he did not see its feet. He said its neck bobbled up and down. He initially said it was carrying its prey in its mouth, and he said he saw it in July of 1933. Why would July of 1933 be significant? Because there was a national monster craze going on in British pop culture at the time. The monster craze began just a few months earlier in April 1933, and it was prompted by something very specific. The 1933 release of the movie King Kong. Loxton reports, There is no question that the birth of Nessie correlates closely in time with the release of the film. King Kong opened in London on April 10, 1933, just four days before Aldi McKay's sighting of the disturbance in Loch Ness. The film was an instant box office smash. Thousands are being turned away from Kong, reported the Daily Express from Trafalgar Square. Those who did make it into the packed theaters came out white and breathing heavily. It was a sensation, a monster thriller so real and so terrifying that moviegoers cried out in their seats. So maybe Aldi McKay had monsters on her mind when she saw splashing in the loch, and she interpreted it in terms of something monstrous. Then is the idea that something similar happened with Mr. Spicer, that he may have seen something and interpreted it as a monster crossing the road? Some have proposed that, but it's really hard to imagine what he could have seen crossing the road that he would mistake for a dragon or a giant prehistoric beast with a long, wavy neck. I mean, I've heard people suggest maybe he saw a deer crossing the road, but those are familiar creatures that don't look like dragons or dinosaurs. Uh, Mrs. McKay may have been innocently primed to interpret the distantly seen splashing as a monster, but given how detailed Mr. Spicer's account is, we need to consider the possibility that he was simply hoaxing everything. King Kong is a movie about a giant ape. Why would that inspire him to hoax an encounter with a giant dragon-like beast? Because King Kong isn't the only monster in the film. King Kong is a giant ape, but he lives on Skull Island, which is infested with dinosaurs. So we also get to see in the movie a Stegosaurus, a Pteranodon, an Elasmosaurus, and either a Brontosaurus or a Diplodocus. The The film isn't clear on which species it is, as well as other monsters. And if you examine the scene 
in which the Brontosaurus or Diplodocus appears, striking similarities to the Spicer account emerge. Loxton reports, Among the most memorable scenes in King Kong is a night attack by a long-necked water monster. As crewmen from the venture raft tensely across a fog-shrouded lake in pursuit of the abducted heroine, something sinister stirs in the water. A dark, swan-like neck arcs out of the water and then slides back out of sight. The men peer through the dense fog when suddenly the looming neck attacks out of the darkness. The raft is overturned, spilling the men into the lake. In a series of dramatic shots, the huge plesiosaur-like animal plucks men out of the water and kills them. This creature, with its rounded back, arched neck, and small head, is essentially identical to the plesiosaur-like popular Nessie that would grow out of Spicer's story. As the remaining venture crewmen scramble to the seeming safety of the shore, they learn a terrible truth. The creature is not an aquatic plesiosaur, but a diplodocus-like sauropod. The monster pursues the men onto land, and at this point, Spicer's sighting snaps sharply into focus. In both his description and his sketch, Spicer almost exactly recreated this scene from King Kong. Spicer's creature crossed the road from left to right, just as the Diplodocus on land crosses the movie screen. As Spicer's beast crossed the road, we could see a very long neck which moved rapidly up and down in curves. The body then came into view. For its part, the somewhat implausibly writhing neck of the film's dinosaur enters first, followed by its huge body. The movie's creature gives the impression of having gray, elephant-like skin. Spicer's creature had gray skin, quote, like a dirty elephant or a rhinoceros. The 30-foot Loch Ness Beast is of roughly similar size to the movie monster. When it was broadside on, it took up all the road. It was big enough to have upset our car. I estimated the creature's length to be about 25 to 30 feet. A few other diagnostic details make the case especially compelling. In the shots from the movie, the sauropod's feet are not visible. For ease of animation, they're shielded from view by bushes and enshrouding fog. Likewise, in Spicer's version, we did not see any feet. Especially striking is the profile that the two creatures have in common. The film's Diplodocus is shown with its tail curved out of view around the far side of its body. According to Spicer's description of his monster, I think its tail was curved round the other side from our view. Finally, there is the troublesome description in Spicer's letter to the Inverness Courier that the monster appeared to be carrying a small lamb or animal of some kind. Later, paraphrased versions of his story suggested that the lamb or animal could refer to the end of the creature's tail sticking up above its shoulder, or perhaps something riding on the monster's back. But at face value, this appears to be a direct description of the last shot in King Kong's sauropod scene. Reaching into a tree, the dinosaur grabs a surviving crew member in its mouth and shakes him. In a shot that exactly matches Spicer's sketch, the doomed man looks exactly like a small lamb or animal of some kind in the monster's mouth. And numerous researchers have noted similarities between this sequence in King Kong and George Spicer's account. In fact, this goes all the way back to Rupert's goal, Rupert Gould's The Loch Ness Monster and Others, the very first book about the creature, which came out in 1934. Gould reports the following about his interview with Spicer. While discussing his experience, I happened to refer to the Diplodocus-like dinosaur in King Kong, a film which I discovered we had both seen. He told me that the creature he saw much resembled this, except that in his case no legs were visible, while the neck was much larger and more flexible. So Spicer admitted that he'd seen the film King Kong. He said that he saw very much resemblance between the creature in the film and what he saw. This should have alerted Gould to the possibility of a hoax, the way it did multiple later researchers. Because although Spicer didn't acknowledge these facts, the monster in the film and the monster Spicer claimed to see both were dragon-like prehistoric animals, had long necks that bobbed up and down, 
could move both in water and on land, crossed from left to right, had their tails wrapped around the far side of their bodies, didn't have visible feet, and were carrying prey in their mouths. All that is too much to simply be coincidence. I thus conclude that the George Spicer account is a hoax, that it had a profound influence on later perceptions of the monster, and that it was the direct inspiration for the long-necked plesiosaur theory, the, even though in the film the monster only at first appeared to be a plesiosaur and later turned out to be a creature capable of living on land. Where does that leave us with the plesiosaur theory? Not in a very good place. Uh, between the intrinsic unlikelihood that plesiosaurs would have survived the Cretaceous extinction event, the implausibility that there could be a breeding population of 30 or more of them in a 22-mile Loch Ness without their presence being obvious, uh, the collapse of the photographic evidence upon careful examination, the vagueness of eyewitness reports, the sudden emergence of reports in 1933 just after the release of King Kong, and the obvious similarities of the Spicer account and a particular sequence in King Kong, many Loch Ness Monster researchers have now abandoned the plesiosaur theory, and I think they're right to do so. As much as I would absolutely love for there to be plesiosaurs living in Loch Ness or anywhere else, I don't think that the evidence actually supports this. Have researchers who believe in the Loch Ness Monster come up with theories to replace the plesiosaur hypothesis? They have. Just because plesiosaurs may not be living in the loch doesn't mean that nothing unusual lives there, and so there are alternative theories, although I must confess that they're not as exciting as a plesiosaur. Wikipedia summarizes some options. R.T. Gould, the author of the 1934 book The Loch Ness Monster and Others, suggested a long-necked newt. Roy McCall examined the possibility, giving it the highest score, 88%, on his list of possible candidates in 1976. In 1968, F.W. Holliday proposed that Nessie and other lake monsters, such as Morag, may be a large invertebrate, such as a bristle worm. He cited the extinct Tully monstrum as an example of the shape. According to Holliday, this explains the land sightings and the variable back shape. He likened it to the medieval description of dragons as worms. Although this theory was considered by Macau, he found it less convincing than eels, amphibians, or plesiosaurs. So we have alternative theories of what the Loch Ness Monster may be. It might be an extra-large version of conventional animals like newts, which do exist today but are very small, extinct forms of bristle worms, which no longer exist today, Greenland sharks, which live in the North Atlantic and can grow to be 20 feet long, Wells catfish, which can grow to 10 feet long or more, sturgeon fish, which can grow up to 18 feet long, and eels, for example, the European conger eel, which can grow up to 10 feet long. So not as exciting as plesiosaurs, but some possibilities. Does the scientific evidence we currently have support any of these possibilities? Maybe the idea of a breeding population of giant newts or giant bristle worms living in the loch is really hard to support, but the idea of a population of large eels has more evidence in its favor. And why do you say that? Because in 2019, a group of scientists did a DNA survey on the loch. In other words, they took water samples and then analyzed the strings of DNA that they found in it to identify the kinds of creatures that are living in the lake. Large animals with a stable breeding population in Loch Ness ought to shed enough DNA to show up on the survey. And according to the BBC, here's what they found. Professor Neil Gemmill, a geneticist from New Zealand's University of Otago, said, People love a mystery. We've used science to add another chapter to Loch Ness's mystique. We can't find any evidence of a creature that's remotely related to a plesiosaur in our environmental DNA sequence data. So, sorry, I don't think the plesiosaur idea holds up based on the data that we've obtained. He added, 
So there's no shark DNA in Loch Ness based on our sampling. There's also no catfish DNA in Loch Ness based on our sampling. We can't find any evidence of sturgeon either. There is a very significant amount of eel DNA. Eels are very plentiful in Loch Ness, with eel DNA found at pretty much every location sampled. There are a lot of them. So, are they giant eels? Well, our data doesn't reveal their size, but the sheer quantity of the material says that we can't discount the possibility that there may be giant eels in Loch Ness. Therefore, we can't discount the possibility that what people see and believe is the Loch Ness monster might be a giant eel. DNA from humans, dogs, sheep, cattle, deer, badgers, rabbits, voles, and birds were also identified by the researchers. So the 2019 DNA survey ruled out things like plesiosaurs. Not that we know what plesiosaur DNA looked like specifically, but plesiosaurs were reptiles, and we do know what reptile DNA looks like. It also eliminated the idea of sharks, catfish, and sturgeon, eliminating the Greenland shark, the Wells catfish, and sturgeon as good candidates. The only candidate that the survey could support was eels. They found a lot of eel DNA, though they couldn't tell whether this DNA was being thrown off by large eels or by lots of smaller ones. But the European conger eel can grow up to 10 feet long. Anomalous specimens might grow even longer. And some large eels might be responsible for some of the sighting. So if there is anything anomalous living in Loch Ness, some kind of giant eel breed would be the best bet. However, even that seems like a bit of a long shot to me. At this point, we don't have evidence that suggests that there is anything anomalous living in Loch Ness, not strong evidence. And as disappointing as it is, the Loch Ness monster theory has fallen on hard times. Recent books that I've read by cryptozoologists that are scientifically oriented, as opposed to just let's tell wild stories cryptozoologists, um, don't really devote that much attention to it. They're more interested in talking about other possible lake and river cryptids, and they tend to cover the Loch Ness Monster only briefly and rather unenthusiastically, it seems. Sightings of the creature also are down compared to past decades, suggesting that this was a passing cultural or social phenomenon. However, they still keep track of reported sightings, a gentleman named Gary Campbell runs the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Registry, and there is a live webcam for the loch for people to watch. So they've taken to crowdsourcing the effort of Nessie spotting. We'll have links to both the webcam and the registry, so you can take a look, and who knows, you might just see the Loch Ness Monster. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the Loch Ness Monster? I would love for the Loch Ness Monster to be real, I would especially love it if it turned out to be a plesiosaur. However, I don't, I think it's quite unlikely that plesiosaurs would have survived the extinction of the dinosaurs, and also very unlikely that there is a breeding population of their descendants in Loch Ness. I thus think that the plesiosaur hypothesis fails. I think that the reason reports of the monster suddenly took off in 1933 was because of the release of King Kong, and that the Spicer account, which directly inspired later accounts, came from a particular sequence in King Kong, which Spicer then used as the basis for a hoax. While I can't completely rule out that there are unusual creatures living in Loch Ness, like giant eels, I think the evidence for these is weak, and I don't think that they're the likely explanation for the reports. It is more likely that reports of the creature are misidentifications that take their inspiration from the monster craze that King Kong spawned, and that there is nothing particularly unusual in Loch Ness. I thus conclude that no matter how much I'd love the Loch Ness monster to exist, there likely isn't anything truly strange at the basis of this story. Oh. Well, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer the listener when they want to explore more? We'll have links to Loxton and Prothero's book, Abominable Science, Origins of the Yeti, Nessie, and Other Famous Cryptids. 
Also, Darren Nash's book, Hunting Monsters, Richard Freeman's uh, book, Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 1, and Richard Freeman's book, In Search of Real Monsters, which is Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 2. We'll also have, uh, and by the way, those guys, whether they're skeptical or more believing, the authors of those books are more scientifically oriented. They're not just the let's tell wild stories kind of cryptozoologist. So if you want a, a very sympathetic, uh, scientifically oriented cryptozoologist, Richard Freeman's books are worth reading. Also, we'll have information on plesiosaurs, coelacanths, uh, Ryan and Scott's Nature article, Naming the Monster. Also, a link to lock-ness.com. Also, the Museum of Hoaxes page on Nessie, the BBC article on the uh, 2019 DNA survey, as well as the Loch Ness live webcam and the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Registry. Excellent. Well, that's it from us. What were your theories about the Loch Ness Monster and the evidence we've uncovered? We would love to hear from you, and you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world. You can post in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or call our mysterious feedback line, 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for doing the video and animation work on this episode. Um, you can see their work by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always receive a notification whenever I release a video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. Jimmy, what are we going to be talking about next time? Next week is Christmas, so we'll be answering weird questions that have to do specifically with Christmas and the Christmas holiday. So we're going to be looking at issues like whether the Star of Bethlehem was a UFO, whether the infancy narratives provide evidence for time travel, what's the deal with Krampus, the morality of Santa Claus, and much, much more. Excellent. And since you mentioned Christmas, a great Christmas present would be a Mysterious World t-shirt mug or many of the other things we offer in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 237. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Doc. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken with a special message as we approach the Christmas season. This past year, the StarQuest Network has continued to expand our mission of exploring the intersection of faith and pop culture through our many entertaining and informative programs. Here on Mysterious World, we've continued to expand our video audience on YouTube with shows that provide extra content and context for our discussion of the mysteries as well as more interviews with experts and bonus content that goes beyond our weekly episodes. We want to continue improving the show and keep reaching even more people while providing you with the fascinating mysteries that you enjoy every week. 
That's why it's very important that we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you're already a supporter of StarQuest, we thank you and ask you to prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. If you're not yet a supporter, please become one now. Every gift counts. Could you give $15 a month or even just $10 a month? Whatever level of support you can offer, please show your support for StarQuest this Christmas, and remember that your gifts are tax-deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. May God bless you this Advent, and may you have a blessed Christmas season. Thank you.